So, uh, three speakers. They have been crawling around Monroe, St. Clair, Randolph, Carstarius for decades. Uh, three speakers. Sam Pino is a geochemist who will speak first with the Illinois State Water Survey. Walt Kelly is the head of the Groundwater Science Division of the Illinois State Water Survey. And Steve Taylor is a cave biologist, entomologist with the Illinois Natural History Survey. You may not know that those three surveys and the Illinois State Archaeological Survey are all gathered together at the University of Illinois under an institute called Prairie State Prairie Research Institute. Prairie Research Institute. And you also may not know that the, the, the concept of history surveys, natural history, water, geology, Illinois was the first state in the United States to set up such a survey over 100 years ago. And what the survey's job is to take real science and make it applicable to the citizens of the state of Illinois. And they do. So these three guys have been crawling around here through caves into sinkholes from Champaign, Urbana for many years. Many of the washers, dryers, and refrigerators that we have in our sinkholes, they brought down. <laughs> so, um, Sam will go first. If you can't hear Sam, sometimes he's soft. Shout. Shout. Louder, Sammy. Okay. Okay, here we go. Take it away, Sam Payne. Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, this is, uh, is going to be uh, a talk by the three of us. I'm actually with the Geological Survey. And uh, Walt Kelly is going to talk about uh, hydrogeology and water quality uh, within the caves. And Steve is going to interrupt, ask <laughs> questions, and, and periodically interject things. That, uh, but he's, he's not. Going to stand up here and speak. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to talk about the geology and hydrogeology of uh, Monroe County and the karst, and then I'm going to talk about the water quality. And um, so we we put our talks together, and, and about an hour ago we looked at them, and, and they they're pretty they mesh pretty well. So we don't we don't have them we now have them in one one PowerPoint presentation. So, what is KARST? Um, I'm sure all of you know what KARST is. Actually, uh, I was here in August and I gave a presentation um, along these lines, except I didn't I didn't reuse my talk. So you don't have to worry. I did reuse my jacket. <laughs> so this um, so it's it's all new stuff and what I'm gonna do is talk about geology, hydrogeology um, how the water moves through the caves, and uh, and then um, go to some uh, some new research that we just started like a month ago, and some of it's over on the wall here, uh, and we're looking we're using uh, lidar imagery, which I'll talk about, <clears throat> and um, we're looking at basically the uh, the surface, the land surface, and all of the sinkholes and everything else, and what that tells us about. Uh, about the caves and, uh, and uh, water quality and, and karst. Uh, so karst, this is a definition I made up um, based on uh, other people's work, but it's, uh, if you can read it if you want, uh, I'll, it's a, karst is a geologically, hydrogeologically integrated self-organizing network. This is kind of complicated. <clears throat> Sorry, I apologize for that. But it's it's a system that um, develops from water moving through the rocks as fractures. Um, the, uh, the rocks are initially fractured by um, tectonic forces, the, the plates, uh, or the plate tectonics, I assume. Um, different plates on the earth crunch up against each other and, and fractures bedrock all across continents. And basically, all all rocks are fractured. The difference with uh, carbonate rocks, limestone and dolomite, is is they dissolve in uh, in rainwater very slowly. <clears throat> but if you have a million years or hundred thousand years, you can dissolve a lot of rock. 
and it dissolves by by the recharge. The water, the rainwater comes down, and gets into the fractures, dissolves a little bit, and then finds bedding planes and then flows off somewhere uh, and discharges into the surface stream. And um, so that's that's the basically the idea. Um, so you have the soluble rock, rainwater moving through it, uh, and it's um, the, the water moving through the rock is, is part of the hydrologic cycle, which Walt will talk about. But it's it's basically it rains, uh, the water runs off into the ocean, the water evaporates in the ocean, and then it comes back as rain. And um, but uh, you have a, a small system of the cars, and then finally. Um, the physical and chemical weathering of the rock. Once you once you get larger openings, um, the uh, you get gravels and sands down there, and, and you get some physical erosion where you're actually scouring the rocks. So it's it's not only dissolving it but scouring it as well. <clears throat> so this is this is um, the karst terrain of. Can anybody see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't. <laughs> oh. so, um, Use your finger. <laughs> okay, good idea. So this is. <laughs> this is this is obviously Illinois, and these are the karst areas of uh, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and so forth. So the Midwestern U.S. and um, about twenty-five percent of Illinois is. Is uh, has karst, karst, uh, karstified bedrock in it, and um, this is uh, Monroe County and a little bit of St. Clair County, and um, this is the geology that we're looking at. The blue in this area is uh, Mississippian uh, age limestone, and uh, the limestone is uh, is part of a larger Body of rock that actually kind of dives into the into the uh, into the Illinois, actually the Illinois basin. So it's it's kind of tilted and, and goes into the rock, and it's covered by Pennsylvanian age shales and um, coal bearing units, and it's exposed here along the edge of the Illinois basin. Um, Sam, well, I still can't see it. I'm colorblind and uh, still things I can't see. So, um, anyway, so this this blue strip actually dives under the uh, younger rocks here, and um, so these these limestones are fractured. They're soluble, and um, and that's why. This is uh, St. Louis limestone, St. Genevieve limestone. Two of the limestones that uh, St. Louis limestone actually comes around as an exposed in um, Kentucky in uh, the um, Mammoth Cave area. So Mammoth Cave is made of the same rock, and it's it's got 350 miles of explorable passage. Uh, so we have a lot of sinkholes, a lot of caves. <coughs> And um, so this is just an example of, of southwestern Illinois uh, sinkholes, and you can see <clears throat> the area is, is uh, very densely packed with sinkholes. Um, these are the um, <coughs> the karst areas within the state isolated, um, this, and this is just a kind of a box diagram showing <clears throat> what the what the bedrock looks like. Beneath the uh, beneath the surface. So this is this is an area in uh, Canada, and it's carbonate rock. And this is this is essentially what um, the rock would look like if you if you stripped all of the uh, sediment off the surface. Except the crevices here are probably in this photograph probably only a couple inches wide. Here they're a couple feet wide, and we've excavated. Uh, some of these sinkholes, and, and you can uh, crawl down into 
the crevices and get into small caves that are about this big and uh, very, very tiny, but it's, um, it's carrying away sediment that's falling in. This is along Route 3. I'm sure you've seen this. But these are the crevices exposed at the surface. Um, this is um, in um, Joe Davis County in northwestern Illinois, and this is, this is Dolomite. But during the drought of 2012, the, um, the soils are very thin, so where they had, um, where the farmers had planted alfalfa, the roots went down into the crevices, and that alfalfa was able to survive, whereas everything else died out. So you can see basically a reflection of the crevices in the bedrock. Um, another, another example. And so this is an aerial photograph, and what you're looking at is, is um, alfalfa, but it's, it's reflecting the fractures of the subsurface. And this is Walt Kelly walking along, and you can see some of the traces of the fractures in the alfalfa. You feel? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so this is the way the sinkholes form. Um, you'll get uh, here in this area, we have about 30 feet of sediment. Um, it's a, it's a fine silt called luss and some glacial material, uh, glacial till, which is kind of a clay, uh, clay fine sediments. And it's about 30 feet thick. And um, what happens is, is you get a crevice a foot, two feet wide, and they come along, they're along fractures, and, and the, the fracture width changes a little bit, but um, it's uh, essentially uh, fairly uniform. And the sediment falls in, and then it's washed away and uh, by, by groundwater. So the water table is somewhere around here in this, in this diagram. And then it grows a little bit because it's just it's collapsing. And at some point, the whole plug at the top falls in. And then erosion takes over and makes it kind of a smooth, bowl-shaped feature. And um, so it, it remains. And um, so this is this is what you see, um, sort of circular sinkholes, um, some tree filled, some some are ponds, some uh, some are plowed over, so they're they're smooth and, and uh, more shallow. But uh, in uh, Monroe County, um, well, in the sinkhole plain, which is a lot of Monroe County, a little bit of Randolph, a little bit of St. Clair County. We counted over 15,000 sinkholes, um, large sinkholes, 100 feet across, <coughs> so a lot. Um, there's one that's uh, on the ground filled with trees. Um, often, if, the, uh, if they're too rugged, they'll be avoided by the farmers uh, when they're plowing. And uh, some are plugged up and uh, form ponds, nice circular ponds. <clears throat> and then um, there's also caves, a lot of caves. This is Auctioneer Cave. You'll see this picture again. Um, so then uh, this, is, this is where the water is discharging <clears throat> when it rains and um, coming down and then into a, a stream valley. <coughs> so, so this is the yellow. Is, um, the blue is limestone, and the yellow is our sinkholes that we um, we digitized. We um, we took um, <clears throat> we took electronic maps uh, and GIS uh, ge geographical um, uh, something system information system. Anyway, um, what you can do is, is you can go in and mark each sinkhole, and that's what we did. We counted them um, using aerial photos, uh, LIDAR imagery, which I'll talk about in a minute, and um, topographic maps. And so this is the pattern we see. This is full pole cave uh, from our basin here. And then up in this area, you're getting into uh, the Waterloo up area. That's all right. So that, that gives you an idea of, of 
the density and, and where the, the sinkholes are located, pretty much uh, the, the central strip down the county. Um, this is, this is, I'm going to talk about um, the origin of some of the caves <coughs> in southwestern Illinois. I'm going to focus on Illinois Caverns and Fogelfold Cave. And several years ago, we, we looked at um, how, they, uh, how they formed and how long ago they formed, how old they are. And, um, oh, this, this is Steve Taylor, by the way, um, outside of Fogelfold Cave. Um, three days ago, so it doesn't change much. <laughs> so this is uh, Illinois Caverns uh, cross in cross section, <clears throat> and what we did was uh, we have um, we know where it discharges and enters, and we measured some elevations using uh, surveying equipment, and um, so this is like a slice through the rock, if you, if you would. Uh, and uh, so this, this shows you uh, what the cave looks like, and it, this is sediment and, the pro and, and um, sinkholes. So these, these depressions are all sinkholes. Um, and then, uh, so the water, the water, actually, the water, groundwater is uh, here, and it's, uh, so the black is the water table with the triangle. And so if you dug a well, that's where you would put the water. And as you go outside of the basin, um, in the um, what's called um, groundwater divide, um, all the water that it rains on this side of the groundwater divide flows into Illinois caverns and goes in that direction. Everything over here goes in another direction. It discharges in another direction and enters the rock. So, so you get all this water recharging. Um, and, and creating the, the water table, the Illinois cavern is draining that water so that everything above it <clears throat> is dry. I mean, these rocks are dry. And because, because there's no water in the sediments, um, the, the, the sediment tends to collapse into these crevices. If the, uh, if the water table came up into the sediments, as it does over here, you don't see sinkholes. Um, it's, it acts as a support, it's called hydrostatic pressure, and it, it supports the sediment. <clears throat> so so that's, that's basically what we're seeing. So that's why when you go into Illinois Caverns, um, there's a stream running through it, and, uh, and it's draining all the rocks around it. And uh, the, same for, the same goes for a focal pole cave. And, you know, again, the sinkholes. Um, think about interesting about this football cave is the rocks kind of have a depression here, a swale where the uh, the uh, recharging water tended probably tended to focus in this area and, and kind of drilled a, a pathway uh, through the rocks, if you will. Um, now we're going to talk about. Um, the uh, glaciation or the Pleistocene uh, uh, effects of the Pleistocene of Illinois um, when, uh, when ice uh, started moving through the area about 1.8 million years ago to about 12,000 years ago. So there were successive periods of glaciation and um, so these, these glaciers would come and go. And, uh, and we still may be in it. Um, it's, uh, periods are, are called uh, periods of glaciation and then interglacial and then glacial. And uh, so we may be in an interglacial period right now, and, and, and maybe in 5,000, 10,000 years, there'll be another, or more, there'll be another glacier moving through this area. But um, there were two, two that we. Um, have a lot of information on. One was uh, the Illinois Glacier, which, which came down uh, to southern Illinois and caught most of Monroe County. <clears throat> and then the Wisconsin Glacier that uh, didn't quite make it down. The Illinois <coughs> Glacier <coughs> uh, came through uh, about 100 and, 
90,000 to 130,000 years ago. So a 60,000 year span where uh, glacial ice covered most of Illinois. And um, then, it, then it migrated. It, it, uh, it melted and um, went back up north and it was basically the uh, uh, most of the water during that time was tied up in, in glacial ice. Um, and what happened, so from 190 to 130,000 years ago, this, the glaciers were, were pushing through Illinois, tied up a lot of the water, things became very dry. Um, and um, so it was, it was a, uh, a period when uh, the, uh, the ice uh, was, was um, about a mile thick up in the Chicago area. So it's, it's and, then, and then there were, this is a uh, bone cave, this is a, a bone from a, a sloth, a three-toed sloth that uh, lived in the area. And um, this is a, this, uh, there were other areas. This, this is part of the cave where there were a lot of, a lot of Pleistocene age bones. Uh, other things were deer, uh, horses, uh, bison, and, um, and muskox, apparently, as, as Carl said. <coughs> so, so the, uh, and then mastodons. So a lot of these animals were, were living on the edge of the ice and, uh, and down in this area. So what we did was uh, we went into the Cold Cave and noticed that some of the side passages, which are the main passage, something like 30 feet in diameter, with a river running through it, and some of the side passages were um, probably 15 feet in diameter, and then they were plugged with sediment, uh, fine-grained sediment. And um, so what we did was we excavated through the sediment and, um, and dated the, uh, the sediment using the carbon-14 dating technique. So any organic material in there um, was we could actually figure out how old it was. And uh, the material ranged in age from 45,000 years to uh, uh, 20,000 years. And uh, so it was, it was a very tight range of, of this material, and it looked, and, and we found maybe five or six of these locations where the, the side passages were totally filled, and we, we assumed that most of the cave had filled um, with the sediment uh, between, between these ages, 45,000 years to 20,000 years. And um, so it was a... Uh, a period when it was very dry, uh, we looked at um, we got some uh, carbon isotopes of it. We could figure out that the vegetation was sparse and very dry, dry type, uh, dry land type vegetation, which implied that if it if it rained, what would happen is is you would get a lot of erosion, and um, so if there was uh, there was we had this huge drought, and so there would be a huge rainstorm. You would, you would tend to wash that material very quickly into, uh, into the caves. Um, as possible, a lot of the sinkholes that we see today were formed at that time. Um, so we, we excavated uh, at, at some point. I have another photograph where you can just see his feet. He's down. He's upside down. In his um, but um, this is this is kind of a, a cross section of what we what we saw. So here's the, the main passage and then the side passage. So you got about thirty feet in diameter, and they all have these benches um, associated with them. And, and what that's from is is once the uh, this this cave was constantly down cutting. So you know it's down to here at some point when the when the side passage filled, it stopped. Um, it stopped. Uh, it stopped growing or stopped cutting around that bench area. So the, the height of the bench tells us how fast this this uh, cave is down cutting uh, by erosion, by dissolution, since forty thousand years ago. And so it gives us a forty thousand year record of you know 
how long it takes to really cut through this rock. So we extrapolate it to the ceiling and say, well, it took 40,000 years to cut that deep. And this would take, um, it turns out, about 130,000 years. So, so we, um, we use that. And we, use, we also use stalagmites as well <coughs> and dated those. Um, so the oldest stalagmites and, and flowstone we find in the cave for about 125,000 years old. <coughs> and we have down cutting rates or incision rates, uh, very small, but so over a long period of time, but it, it takes out a lot of material. So we came up with a, a, a time for um, the uh, origin of the caves, that, when the caves actually started to grow uh, were initiated of about 130,000 years, which is uh, the end of the Illinois glacial period, and uh, which, as I said, went from 190 to 130,000 years. So it's about then that, that these glaciers started to melt and the water started to rush into these, these crevices and bedding plains and create the caves. Um, this is um, the LIDAR I was talking about, the, the LIDAR imagery that uh, we just, um, we just were starting to look at. And I, I showed this type of thing a little bit in August, um, some of it, but I, I don't want to show you. But uh, this gives you an introduction to what LIDAR is. And basically, uh, it's a plane flying over, over uh, terrain and spraying out um, laser pulses in a, in a sweeping fashion. And, um, and then there are detectors on the plane that catch the reflections of these lasers, uh, laser pulses. And then because they know how long, how fast light travels, they can actually calculate the, uh, the time it takes yeah, the distance, so they can get an elevation because they know what the elevation of the plane is. So they can basically uh, paint the ground surface and um, get a get a feel for get a feel for um, what the um, what the surface topography is like. So this is this is um, what it's, uh, and you can actually take the data and there's like first returns, second returns, third returns, so that you know some of the some of the light gets lost in the trees, and um, so but the initial initial material the initial flashes come back for the for the highest material, and then and then it's slower for the lower stuff. <clears throat> but you can get a three dimensional model of the surface and uh, everything. Um, so this is. Uh, this is an aerial photograph, and um, show you right then. And you can see um, there are sinkholes. This is southwestern Illinois. You can see sinkholes. Uh, there's one, and there's a lot in the trees that you cannot see. So with lidar elevation models, we can see more sinkholes, and we can actually take away the trees by taking away the the uh, flashes, the, the data that come in from the tops of the trees. And uh, you can see the sinkholes over that, that tree line area in, in great detail. And this is something that we had a hard time doing with aerial photography. You know, you, even though you take photographs in uh, times when there are no leaves on the trees, it was difficult to see this stuff. So now we have a very detailed a uh, picture of what the, what the sinkholes look like in the area. <clears throat> um, I think this is another example. We also used um, uh, topographic maps which showed uh, some of the sinkholes under the trees. And um, but with the LIDAR elevation models, we can make our own topographic maps and uh, get much more detailed. This is, this is like a 20-foot contours. Um, whereas we can get five foot contours and even two foot contours um, for these. So you can see a lot of detail in these, in these uh, models. Um, in fact, there's a, 
a new sinkhole that formed on the on the uh, edge of two sinkholes. <coughs> yeah. So another thing we did was uh, we looked at historic aerial photography, and uh, this was during the 1940s, or uh, actually 1940, at the end of the of the uh, dust bowl period, and. Um, so the, uh, the sinkholes actually were ringed by a very dry uh, layer of soil. So you can, they, they highlighted that. And then, um, so then we also looked at, um, so that was, I'm oh, sorry. This was, this was 2005, and this was two, 1940. And you can see the lighter colored. So, so we're looking at sinkholes like that. And then the uh, the lidar elevation models made it even more prominent. So what do we do with that? Well, with this with this new project, we have um, <coughs> Waterloo Quadrangle, which is uh, here, um, and the Renault Quadrangle, which is uh, where where uh, Pole Cave is located. And uh, we have very dense. Uh, information, uh, layer information from those. And we can see that the, um, the shapes of these, of these sinkholes, and they, this, the shapes of the sinkholes tell us quite a bit. This is Waterloo. Uh, the town is over here, and there's some structures, geologic structures. But the red um, shows us, uh, this is one cave system here, Plutler cave system, mm -hmm. and then another cave system here, and then a third over there. So you can actually, separate the cave systems uh, visually. And um, so this is, this is uh, without all that other information in there, but, but you can see that it clearly separates the, the different basins from our basins. Um, and then this is um, down in uh, Renault Quadrangle. This is the, uh, the uh, Fogopole Cave Groundwater Basin. And you can see that these branching sinkholes, most depressions. <coughs> and what we can see is um, we can see where the uh, where the basin actually is based on the shape of the sinkholes. And um, so by, by looking at the a detail of these uh, sinkhole shapes, we can we can uh, help we can predict where the basin boundaries are. Uh, <coughs> And then finally, uh, we're looking at um, different uh, products from the, the LIDAR. And this, this is just an elevation model in different colors, but this is up in, up in uh, Waterloo. And you can see these angular shapes of, uh, angular shapes of, the, of the river. Um, which, uh, that, so, that goes uh, it's near town or goes through town, um, and that's reflecting the, the fracture system that uh, in the uh, in the bedrock. So, based on this, we can we can uh, look at the fracture system and, and map that out. Um, this is this is kind of an extreme color of the same area, but what it does show is, is it shows linear features that. Um, represent the fractures. They, they, the fractures actually shine through, as did the, um, the alfalfa. Um, it, it, with, the, with the LIDAR, if we use different colors, we can actually accentuate the uh, reflection of the fractures through that sediment. When you're talking about 30 feet of sediment, and we're still, we're still seeing the fracture traces. And um, now we can we can get a lot more detail. These are these are ponds all around, but you can see the, the fracture or the uh, the, uh, the sinkholes, and you can you can put a uh, I'm sorry you can you can put a, a line of cross section through there, and instantly you get um, a, uh, a, a representation of the surface and and what it looks like. And these are all sinkholes. And this is this is a, a groundwater divide, and this is between two 
groundwater basin. So there's a basin over here and a basin over there. And um, so it's, it's, we're just starting to play with this uh, this week, actually. And then we can rotate it and um, look at it from the side, and look at the terrain from the side, and um, try to uh, try to get as much, bring as much information out of these things as you can. And over on the, um, over here, we have um, some of the paper products, some of the printouts of, of the LIDAR that uh, we can talk about after, after the presentation. Um, and then um, what's interesting is with LIDAR, you can, you can see things that are about this big on the surface. Uh, it's that detail. So that if you look closely at the sinkholes, they look kind of ragged and, and, and it's actually slumping. The, the sediment is actually falling into the hole. Um, and, and that's apparent throughout, throughout these uh, images. And um, go to the uh, Mark, any I'm questions? Sure. I'm not from around here. What river were you talking about? Um, what is that river that goes through town? Mountain Creek. Mountain Creek, that's it. Mountain Creek. Yeah. Is that a river or a creek? Creek. <laughs> creek. <laughs> that's the name. <laughs> okay, like Carl said, I'm uh, I'm Walt Kelly from Illinois State Water Survey, and I'm going to talk about groundwater quality now. There's going to be some overlap with <coughs> some of Sam's stuff. I'll, I'll go through those those quickly. So um, these guys are going to jump in when I say something wrong. Yeah. All right, so I thought what I would do to start out with is just kind of give you a little primer, a little short course of what actually water quality is and, and what it means when we think about when we're talking about water quality. So after 15 minutes, you guys will be experts uh, in water quality, I hope. So, what does water quality mean? Well, it refers to basically the chemical, physical, and biological characteristics of water. It's a measure of the water relative to the requirements of animals or plants or, or us. So the question we would ask, if I'm a human, for water quality, can I drink or can I use this water safely? That's our, the question we ask. If I'm an aquatic organism, my question is, can I thrive in this water because I'm surrounded by this water my whole life? So, those are the basic questions we're asking when we're talking about water quality. So as I'm sure everybody knows, water is H2O, but pure water does not really exist in nature. Okay? Um, it's because water is the universal solvent. You all took chemistry in high school, right? Hopefully you learned some of these things. Um, and things dissolve in water. And this dissolvent material is what actually gives water its quality. Uh, and also the suspended matter. I'll talk in a minute about what the difference is. Uh, and of course, many of the things that are in the water are actually very beneficial and essential to our health. You don't want to go and drink pure water. It's, it's not, it doesn't give you the nutrients that you need. So um, we were evolved, we were designed to drink water that is in nature, which has got plenty of things dissolved in. So having stuff dissolved in water is not a bad thing, but I guess I'm saying. Okay, and we can measure the amount of dissolved material in a water sample. Can that blink you off to uh, it a reflection? Out, okay. It doesn't. All right. It doesn't. Maybe I should stand over here then, but I can't read it. Okay. Um, so we can actually measure the amount of dissolved material in a water sample. Actually, it's a very simple thing to do. Uh, you, you take a sample of water, you know the amount, you, you filter it through material, um, and then you basically make the filter to remove the water and you weigh it. It's basically a, a measurement of weight. And uh, we typically measure this in milligrams per liter. This is called the total dissolved solids content of, of water. And every natural water, like I said, has a certain amount of this in it. Um, Seawater has about 19,000 milligrams per liter or so of dissolved water. 25,000, 19,000 chloride, right? Um, so drinking water is supposed to have a TDS value less than 500 milligrams per liter. Okay, that's so. When we talk about fresh water, it's usually below that level. But we can actually drink that water above that level. It, it won't taste so good to, to many of us. Um, but there are places in the world where they have no option. Uh, places like, say, Namibia, where it's a very dry country. They have to drink any kind of water they have. It's often has two total of salts of 1,000 to 800 milligrams per liter. They drink it, and it's fine. Uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't stand for that, okay? 
Uh, so just to remind you, one milligram per liter is approximately equal to a part per million. So dissolved molecules uh, is somewhat arbitrarily defined. Basically, it's what passes through a 0.45 micrometer filter. And anything that gets caught on that filter that's in the water is considered suspended. So when you go out to a stream and you see that it's brown, most of that is suspended material. You, you could filter that out. If you filtered it out, the water would look much clearer um, than it would with the suspended material in there. Uh, the aqueous species refer to any molecule that's dissolved in water. And ions are molecules that have an electric charge. So bicarbonate is a, is a very common ion, and it has a negative charge, HCO3 minus, whereas carbonic acid is not an ion because it's uncharged. So any of you take chemistry, you might recognize those molecular diagrams. So there are many constituents that are dissolved in water. There are the major ions, and they typically have concentrations greater than 5 milligrams per liter, or parts per million. And there's cations, which are positively charged ions, and there's anions, which are negatively charged. Uh, the primary major cations are calcium, magnesium, and sodium. Sometimes potassium is important. And here they are with their, their charge. So calcium and magnesium have a charge of 2 plus, sodium and, cal and potassium 1 plus. <coughs> the major anions are bicarbonate, sulfate, and chloride. And there's also silicon as an important um, molecule as well. That is an uncharged molecule. And so in groundwater, these this constituents typically count for no greater than 90% of all the dissolved solids in the water, no matter what the concentration of the TDS is. So in, in, in rainwater, in groundwater, in, uh, in seawater even, okay, these are, the, these are the six or seven components that make up most of the total dissolved solids. Okay, then we can talk about minor and trace constituents. So minor constituents typically have a concentration between 0.01 and 10 parts per million, can be higher in certain situations. So potassium, iron, manganese, nitrate, fluoride, boron, these typically fall in the minor uh, category. And then there's trace constituents, which have very low concentrations, less than 0.1 milligram per liter. Most metals fall under this, uh, as well as things like arsenic, bromide, phosphate, and radium. Um, most metals are pretty insoluble, you probably know that. Um, so they don't typically dissolve in water very well, so there's usually not very much in the water. That's a good thing for the most part. I mean, we do need metals in our diet, but we don't need a lot of metals in our diet. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the hydrologic cycle and how that affects the water quality. So I think hopefully everybody learned this at some point in their lives, what the hydrologic cycle means, that, that water is really not created or destroyed on Earth. It's just kind of cycled through these different reservoirs. You can start anywhere on here. You can start with rain falling on the land. It can flow out through uh, streams to the ocean, or it can go down and percolate through the soil and into the groundwater, and then flow out the stream to the ocean. And this uh, condensation it evaporates and goes back into the, condensates into clouds, and the whole thing starts over. Well, this whole cycle also affects the water quality as well as the movement of the water itself. So as rain and snow fall on the land surface, they're very dilute, very low total dissolved solid concentrations. Um, then they hit the soil alone and they pass through the soil zone, the unsaturated zone, and eventually reaches the water table. Okay, so the water table means anything below that, the rocks or sediments are fully saturated with water. It doesn't necessarily mean you can pump that water out. It might be a rock that's very impermeable, but it just means that every pore space is filled with water. So as water passes through the soil sediments and the rocks, it begins to react with the materials that it encounters. So these materials can dissolve, and here's, a, uh, here's the, only, the only chemical formula I'm going to show you. So, uh, so you have well, primary minerals, things like um, calcite, the, the main component of limestone, can react with acid in water and produce secondary miner, mater, uh, minerals, uh, which are like clays and things like that, but also dissolved species and water. So the dissolved species, this is how the dissolved species get into the, uh, the subsurface water. So the essential ingredients needed for dissolving minerals are water and acid. Okay, the most important natural acid is carbonic acid, H2CO3, which basically just dissolves CO2. So that's what's in your, anybody drinking soda right now? Okay. And the secondary minerals are commonly clays, um, so to make up the soils. So as these, these reactions go on and on the TDS increases, and uh, in general, the older the groundwater is, 
the higher is TDS. And there are basin brines in Illinois that are tens of hundreds of thousands of years old, and they have uh, concentrations of TDS that are ten times that of seawater. Hmm. And they've been around for a long time, and they've been reacting the whole time. Okay, so there are other reactions that are occurring that also affect groundwater quality. One of the most important has to do with organic matter. So as I'm sure you're all well aware, soils in Illinois typically have abundant organic matter. Uh, three to five percent is, is typical. Uh, where we're from has some of the best soils in the state. And what happens is the oxygen reacts, the dissolver reacts with organic carbon and produces uh, CO2. And because of this, because of this reaction, the organic carbon of the oxygen, <coughs> most groundwater in Illinois is anoxic. It means there's no dissolved oxygen. After it passes through the soil zone, almost all the oxygen is gone in a typical Illinois situation. We down here are not in a typical Illinois situation, I'll mention. Um, but as an aside, this excess CO2 that's in the soil water, so as the water passes through the soil, it's getting more and more CO2, and because it's kind of isolated from the atmosphere, the CO2 is kind of stuck in the water, can't go anywhere. But it can also eventually lead to the formation of stalactites and stalagmites in caves. What happens is when the water kind of extra, you know, it's extra bubbly with the CO2, as it enters the cave, it tries to equilibrium. So in the cave, you're in like a, 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 a normal atmosphere, and so there's too much CO2 in the water that's coming in. So the CO2 is trying to get out. So that water wants to reestablish its equilibrium with the air that's in the cave. And so the CO2 leaves the gases, and what happens is this causes the calcite to precipitate out of solution, and this is how stalagmites and stalagmites form. All right, so now the groundwater contamination, which I think may be the main interest uh, of you all today. So how do we know when groundwater is contaminated? Okay, there's, there's actually, this is kind of a more complicated question than, than you might realize. There's actually several different ways that you can consider water being contaminated. One could be if you detect any kind of human produced substance in the water, it's therefore contaminated. That means that you have somehow affected the water just because you're finding a compound that's not naturally formed. Even if that compound doesn't necessarily have a bad effect on your health, it still would be considered contaminated. You could also consider, well, what is, what's the normal level of a particular uh, chemical or, or ion? And if you're above that level that you would have if no one was living here, then that would be considered contamination. Uh, you can also just think about it in the terms of water standards, water quality standards. Okay, so these are mainly for drinking water quality, but there's also some for ecological health. If you're above the standard that's been set by some government agency, Therefore, that water is contaminated. So there's, there are different ways to think about how water may be contaminated. It really depends on the question uh, that you're trying to address. And one other thing I want to point out about contaminants, they can be naturally, occurred naturally as well as by human activity. So actually, Illinois groundwater, there are certain situations in the state where we have some natural contaminants. And actually, there are probably more people affected by natural contaminants in groundwater in Illinois than there are from, uh, uh, anthropogenic contaminants. So the two examples are arsenic and radium. So in some of the sand and gravel aquifers in the central and northern part of the state, there are areas where there's pretty high levels of arsenic. And so there's, you know, there's thousands of people who are drinking water or, or have to deal with water that has elevated arsenic levels. And in, that, in some of the bedrock aquifers in the northern half of the state uh, have high radium levels. Okay, radium is radioactive and that needs to be dealt with as well. So these are natural contaminants there, um, you know, we didn't do anything to cause this contamination. It just happens. It's, a, it's, it's we're, we're drilling into water that is not necessarily good for us, but we have to deal with it now. Right, I want to talk a little bit about background because this is an important concept in water quality. Uh, so background can mean several things. It can just be the baseline quality of groundwater, the absence of pollutants. So if we lived in an area where there was no, or we didn't live in an area, the land was considered pristine. There was nobody living there. What is the level of, of that particular compound or, or iron that we're interested in? So indicative of mineral influence by human sources. Uh, it can also be, so water moves from high to low ground. So you can measure above, say, a landfill or a contamination site. What's the con con concentration of a particular contaminant up there? You can compare that to what's down gradient. And that's your contamination is the difference between those two. So the background would be what's up there. 
uh, about that. So we need to know this though. So the, the, the fundamental thing about background is it's something we need to determine so that we can understand what contamination has occurred, if it has occurred, and to what degree. So uh, Sam and I have done a, a number of projects uh, in the state, and uh, some of the values that we've calculated for background levels in groundwater for some common contaminants are, are right here. So for nitrate, measured as nitrogen, two to three milligrams per liter seems to be a common background concentration. So anytime you find a level above that, that suggests some sort of contamination event has occurred. And for chloride, uh, we measure between zero and 15 milligrams per liter as being the background level. All right, so there's, there's literally hundreds of possible groundwater contaminants. Uh, you have organic compounds, so petroleum products, leaky underground storage tanks, industrial chemicals, pesticides, uh, human and animal waste. Um, there's an example of some of the thicker compounds, benzene, TCD, which are, these are solvents that you can find coming out of, um, uh, they used to come out of um, uh, dry cleaners. I don't know if they still are not. Atrogen and rat, a couple of major pesticides. Uh, there are also inorganic contaminants, of course, metals. Many metals are toxic at certain levels. I listed a few there. Uh, nitrate is a big one, especially in uh, agricultural areas. I mentioned, mentioned arsenic already. And then there's biological uh, contaminants. There's bacteria, viruses, and protozoans. You may have remembered uh, a few years ago up in Milwaukee, they had a Giardia outbreak that killed a, a few people. That was actually surface water, but that's an example of a protozoan contaminant. And then there's radioactive. I mentioned already that radium is a, is a problem in certain parts of Illinois. Uh, nitrate, it is probably the most widespread contaminant, human contaminant in the world, uh, affecting groundwater. So it's a drinking water contaminant. At, um, there's, there's some research, it's a, uh, <coughs> something called Blue Baby Syndrome. I can't remember the technical name for it. Uh, but um, in certain, in, in, uh, if your water goes above the standard, a water supply has to provide uh, people with bottled water to drink. It gets above uh, the drinking water standard. Uh, and this has happened in Decatur, for example, in, in years past. So the standard is actually 10 milligrams per liter um, as nitrogen. Uh, and there's possible some other side, of, uh, some other human health effects. But it's still a bit controversial about this. Uh, but maybe even more important, it's an ecological contaminant. It causes algal blooms. Uh, you may have heard of the hypoxic zone down in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, nitrogen is one of the main causes of that. Uh, and elevated ammonia, which is another form of nitrogen, that's toxic to aquatic organisms. And uh, N2O might be a greenhouse gas. It's not as important as carbon dioxide or methane, but it could be important. So here's, for example, the hypoxic Z zone. Uh, this is an area of low oxygen water, um, any kind of uh, bottom dwelling animal can be affected by uh, seasonal low oxygen levels in, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And this is caused by discharge from the Mississippi River uh, coming down there full of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and other things. And of course, Illinois is right in the middle of that. Uh, and by some estimates, Illinois is a major contributor of nitrogen to the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a satellite image. There's the delta, and this, uh, you can just see the material that suspended material coming out of the river being currented down, taken down by the current. And then uh, during the summertime, this can develop into this hypoxic zone, which can be quite large in uh, certain years. All right, so I want to talk just briefly about what drinking water standards are. So we actually have standards for over 100 contaminants in this country. And of course, they're based on uh, studies using rats and mice. There. There's only a few of these that are actually known to be human carcinogens because you can't actually test them on humans, right? So, but the, for example, they learned that benzene was a human carcinogen back before the war. Uh, when people got this, they were using it as a solvent for making shoes, and people got leukemia from using that material. So, there's a few we know for sure are, are definitely human carcinogens. The rest are based on uh, using on rats and mice and things like that. Now, these are only enforced really for public water supplies. And in Illinois, this is regulated by the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, if you have a private well, you are not regulated for your water quality, except when the well is drilled, and the public health department comes out and takes a sample, measures nitrogen, coliform bacteria. If you pass that test, the well is certified to be used. And from then point on, 
It's up to you whether you do anything with uh, your water quality. Does anybody here have their own well? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> so I have a few more things I want to tell you at the end of this talk to help you understand more about your well water quality and your wells and, and how to take care of them. But you're on your own, basically. You all know that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we want to contaminate groundwater, how would we go about doing it? Well, there's three things we need. We need, first of all, a source of contamination. Second, we need to get that contaminate into the aquifer, into the water. We need to dissolve it somehow. So we've got to have a spill or have a pipeline leak or something like that. And then we have to have conditions so that that contaminant stays in solution. So if we try to get a lot of metals, for example, in the water, they may just they say, no way, we're not going to dissolve. There's only a certain amount you can get, and so we're just going to stay here. Um, so, so a lot of contaminants that we would think are really bad are not really necessarily so bad because we can't keep them in the, in the water, so they're not going to go anywhere. Uh, so the, the contaminants that are most important generally the ones that are pretty soluble, ones that can dissolve a lot of them in the water, and they can move pretty, pretty easily through the, the aquifer systems. So reactions in the subsurface can sometimes slow down or even destroy the contaminants. So that's a good thing. And that's why typically groundwater contamination is, a, is better. Groundwater is better in general from a water quality standpoint than surface water. It's because the water is passing through soil and sediments and rock. And a lot of times when it does that, it's removing the contaminants. And sometimes it's adding contaminants too. But that's another story. All right. So how safe actually is our drinking water? Well, Worldwide, the, the, the World Health Organization estimates 2.2 million people die from waterborne diseases annually. Okay, that's obviously a terrible thing. I think you all know that. Um, and actually, that used to be an issue in the United States. But delivering clean drinking water is one of the, one of the great public health achievements of the 20th century in the developed world. Um, but it wasn't that long ago, really when things were as bad here as they are in places like in Asia and Africa and Latin America. So you may, you may know that in the 19th century, for example, uh, Chicago had frequent outbreaks of California, or, excuse me, cholera and dysentery and other waterborne diseases. And sometimes hundreds or, or even, I think on a couple of occasions, thousands of people died from these waterborne diseases. And that's the whole reason that Chicago famously reversed the flow of their river. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that story. Back in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, they they used to they were getting their water, taking water from Lake Michigan, but they were also dumping their sewage back into the lake. So in the summertime, they were pumping in sewage back in and drinking it. <laughs> so they actually reversed. They built a bunch, a couple of canals. They reversed the flow. Now the sewage goes down the Illinois River to Peoria and St. Louis. Thank you very much. And uh, they keep their drinking water nice and clean. But it was a great success for Chicago, St. Louis, not so much. <laughs> okay, now, groundwater is, like I said, considered a, a pretty safe drinking water source compared to surface water. Uh, and, and we do have, have done a, an excellent job in this country, for the most part, of keeping our groundwater, our, our drinking water safe. But there are occasional outbreaks of disease due to drinking water. And the CDC, this is a paper that came out recently, between 1971 and 2008, identified 818 drinking water uh, disease outbreaks in the United States. So I mentioned groundwater is safer, so about 30% of those were actually due to some sort of problem with the groundwater. And that it resulted in uh, over 20,000 cases, 390 hospitalizations, and 13 deaths, okay, because there was something wrong with the groundwater. So this is a period of uh, about 30 years, almost, almost 40 years, uh, and this is for the entire country, okay? So 13 deaths over that period compared to 2.2 million every year, okay, so we're doing a little better, right? But it's still, I would think that's kind of unacceptable that we, we still have waterborne diseases in this country, or deaths from waterborne problems. For groundwater, um, most of these have to do with uh, poor sanitation. So somehow the, the well is not properly maintained, or the septic system is not properly maintained, or it's not properly sited. The septic discharge is somehow getting into the, the well bore, and it's contaminating the water in that way. Uh, another important thing that, that is of interest down here is that vulnerable hydrogeology is that is a more it's more of a problem in places like karst areas than it is say up where we are, where we get our water from a 
sand and gravel aquifer 200 feet below the surface. Uh, here you've got much more rapid water movement through there, and it's more of a problem. And then flooding and heavy rains. And this shows a, a picture of a well someone uses out in the country, uh, south of Champagne. You can see there's some bricks missing. It's an old dug well. And uh, if there's heavy rain or if there's something spilled there, it can go right into the, into the well. And here's a, a, a septic discharge. I think Sam took this picture from somewhere around here. Yes. It was one of the subdivisions to the south. So if this is not properly taken care of, this could be a source of the contamination leading to disease. So the outbreak etiology, which I think is a fancy uh, medical word for what causes what's causing the disease, so it's bacteria, viruses, parasites. Those those are more important than the chemicals, generally. But note that about half of them they don't know what the problem was. They didn't identify the actual cause of the, the, the disease. So a lot of times these are going to be very localized. Just a few people maybe are affected by this. People just using a single well. And sometimes uh, people are, and this is probably an underreporting because people don't necessarily show up at the hospital or whatever saying that I'm, I'm sick from, from dead water, but they probably don't know that. So there's probably still a lot of, we don't know about groundwater disease out there. Too. Uh, and then this last slide I want to show from this particular paper just shows that summer is the worst season. The reason is the warm weather. Okay, in the cold weather, the bacteria and viruses don't thrive as well as, as in the warm weather. So this is now pointing out the way. It's probably bacteria that's probably the main, main problem. All right, so on the karst. Uh, Sam has already gone through most of this, so I'll just go through this kind of quickly. Um, where is this, Steve? Italy or something. Oh, this is Italy, sorry. <laughs> Pretty nice, huh? <laughs> Uh, so this is just a, uh, a U.S. map of the distribution of karst, and showing that most states actually have some karst features, and especially the Midwest. Midwest is really kind of ground central in the United States for karst systems, and, and this is just a percentage of land that's that's in karst. So a uh, quarter of the land of Illinois has karst features. You know, you can to Missouri, where it's more than half. Kentucky is uh, almost at Indiana as well. You know, Iowa, so. Lots of caves, lots of sinkholes, lots of karst issues uh, in the Midwest. So if you're interested in karst, this is the place, one of the places to be. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about water chemistry and karst. Okay, so <coughs> in Illinois, karst is mainly found in, rock, in limestone rocks. And to a lesser degree, some areas dolomite. So limestone is a calcium carbonate. Dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate. And as a result, the dominant ions in groundwater are going to be calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. So they're, they're by far the most important ions in almost all groundwater associated with karst systems. So some more pretty pictures for Illinois karst. This is Steve took this, this is from Monroe County. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you've already seen sinkholes and sinking streams. Uh, so things are different down here. Okay, when we come down here, it's like we're not in Illinois anymore. It feels so different. Uh, we have topography, which we don't have where we're coming from. Um, so there's, that's good news and bad news. You know, it's pretty, but the bad news is you've got these conduits that can uh, lead to contamination. So there's little attenuation, chance for attenuation of contaminants in the soil zone because the water's moving so rapidly from the surface. It doesn't pass through, like in Champagne, it's passing through 100, 200 feet of till before it gets to the groundwater. So it's, it's a lot of chance to, to interact uh, with the materials and remove the contaminants. That doesn't happen you know, here in these karst areas. So karst systems, as a result of this, are vulnerable to surface contamination. So we can get through these sinkholes and move pretty rapidly to the water table and then out into uh, some surface streams. And I mentioned earlier that most groundwater in Illinois is anoxic. But not true here. Most groundwater in karst areas of Illinois is oxic, so there's oxygen in the water. And that's an indication that the water has been at the surface fairly recently. Okay, it's moved pretty rapidly from the surface to the, to the ground, and it's not had a chance to really react with organic materials to remove the oxygen. <coughs> so, actually, Steve made this slide. How to contaminate a karst aquifer? So, Steve is planning on contaminating this aquifer. Um, he's thought about septic system, that's, that's a main source uh, if you're affluent, if you're not properly taking care of your septic material, your septic system, the material can be contaminated, contamination going down through the, um, 
fractured rock that Sam shows from one of the slides. Also had agricultural activities. You can get um, nitrogen and herbicides. Yeah, you can get down to the sinkholes that way. And if your well is not cased properly, uh, you can see that just so. Oops. Uh, that contamination up here can get into your well bore. Okay, so it's better to have your well cased deeply down, down to the uh, to the water table. And some of the new wells have taken care of that. But some of the older wells, that's still an issue. Uh, and then obviously, just activities at the surface are going to be an issue, especially in the karst area. So here's a sinkhole full of garbage. Okay, so not good. Okay, but you, you understand, right? This is going to and uh, if mastodon bones can get down through these sinkholes, you know, so can uh, the tires and I don't know what else is in that picture. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the three of us have been involved in studies this region for a long time. I think Steve's since the 80s, right? <coughs> like in grade school, I think. Um, and we've sampled a bunch of different areas in the region, springs, streams, cave streams, and wells, and also we've gotten into the future. Two septic systems, maybe we can set two septic systems. Uh, and we've investigated numerous types of contamination. We've mainly focused on nutrients, bacteria, and pesticides, but we're, we're looking at some other things as well, especially in some of our newer studies. So I'm going to show some pictures of where you can sample. We're, we're, uh, we've had a couple projects the past a year or so, and we've come back down here to do some uh, kind of periodic sampling of some of these uh, springs and cave streams. So, anybody been to Falling Springs? Okay, so very pretty. Um, here's where the, the outlet is. Oops. And uh, this was taken uh, earlier this week, actually, because we got ice on that. But there's an apron of uh, material, it's called travertine, that's forming um, as the water comes out. As you recall, I mentioned earlier about how the water in the cave can have a little high CO2. As it's coming out, as the water falls and it hits the uh, the ground, it's releasing that CO2. And when it releases the CO2, it can cause a chemical reaction forming this calcite. So this travertine, it's a big apron that is formed. Sam, do you remember how, how thick? Uh, can you wake up, Sam? Uh, how That's thick? Uh, <laughs> about two feet thick. About two feet thick. So how, I can calculate how fast it was growing. How fast it was growing, right? Well, there's a. Uh, you see that pipe coming out of there? Yeah, there's a pipe down here. Yeah, Cliff LaPierre installed that when he was a teenager. And he's got to be 68. So, uh, so, so in 50 years, it's grown. 50 years, it's grown about a foot. About a foot. So that's, for, from a geology standpoint, that's really fast. Okay, so this material can grow quite rapidly. Yes, sir, Yes. Just for those who don't know, this is near Dupo. Yeah, some St. Clair. And this is Fair Creek Spring, which is also up in St. Clair County. Anybody been to that one before? There's actually a cave back there, but I think it's mainly underwater, right? I don't know. Um, it's a pretty big, pretty big spring, though. It's one of the bigger ones right in the area. Uh, here's Stenward Cave um, on Bob Wex uh, land and going down and shooting out from the bottom. There's Steve in his spacesuit. Uh, Cali Spring, the Sportsman Club, you all familiar with this one? Yeah. The spring is, is, is back there. Uh, here's Camp Vandeman, the Boy Scout camp. This is a, we've been to this place a lot. Uh, back there, trying to take some measurements. Uh, Auctioneer Spring, uh, Sam just showed this in his talk, so there's the cave. <laughs> and it's also a falling spring, so it's, the traffic is also being formed. Uh, at the outlet of this, this spring as well. Okay, so now I'm going to show a few data slides to show you some of the results that we've gotten from some of our work. So this is a, based on the study, uh, the sample we've done over the last oh, year or so, I guess. And uh, here's the list of the different caves and springs that we've been sampling. And this is nitrate concentrations. So there, for most of them, there'll be like five dots or some of the three dots, depending on how often we went to them. And here, this, this dotted line is the background, what we kind of estimate as the background concentration. So anything above that background concentration, we would consider to be contaminated okay, by some human activity. So I think you can see that most slither springs and caves at all, almost all times are contaminated with nitrate. All right. 
Um, you can also see there's quite a bit of stability <coughs> in the concentrations. For example, if you look over here, here's Fomopol Cave in, in uh, sample site number one. You can see the concentration by different time periods that we sampled was from about two and a half to almost 10 milligrams per liter. Okay, and that's over about a year. We sampled four or five times over this past year. Okay, and that's the kind of variability that, that we can see in, in, in car system. This is unusual for, for other groundwater systems where the, the water quality tends to be much more, um, much less variable than it is here. Are the highest numbers the most recent? No, okay. actually that was, that was from the first study, I think, 2010. That's about a year ago. That was, that was a year ago in the winter. Yeah. So because it's very ability, though, we can't really draw too many conclusions about where it's coming from or what's happening because it's, it's jumping up and down quite a bit. It's also, you notice it's below the drinking water limit. The drinking water is 10. So most of these are contaminated, but they're not super contaminated. Okay, you could drink, well, you wouldn't want to drink this water. But from a nitrate point of view, you could drink it without suffering any effects. Okay. So, but the point is the water in these springs and caves is contaminated from human activity. Uh, same thing with chloride, actually kind of similar results. Again, the background level, upper background, 15 milligrams per liter. Oops. You don't have to even touch it. Um, again, most of the samples are above that, that, that background threshold. But again, not super high concentrations. Chloride doesn't, is not toxic. It doesn't really have a drinking water standard, except about 250 when it's considered too salty to drink. Um, but I will say that the chloride levels are like much higher in, in Chicago because they're getting chloride from road salt runoffs. And sometimes groundwater can have 100, 200, even 300 milligrams per liter of chloride from road salt runoff. So from a chloride's point of view, we're better off down here than we are up in Chicago, and that's mainly because of the weather. Um, but again, you can see uh, it's, it's contaminated, okay? The human activity is, is affecting this. And this is not really surprising. You guys probably aren't surprised right, that this is happening. Uh, I did want to point out, um, we sampled at three sites in uh, Fogelco Cave. You notice that one of them, number three, was below the background level. And I'll talk about that a little bit about what that might mean uh, for that particular site is. How do these levels compare to what would be considered city water? Well, it depends on where your water is from. Okay, if it's from uh, the Illinois River, it could be, oops, the net nitrogen levels could be similar. Okay, they could be in like the, the four to five range. But for water, we get from like the Mahon Aquifer where we're from, there is no nitrate. Okay, there's, uh, nitrate is, uh, does not really exist in anoxic water. It gets a reaction called denitrification. The, the bacteria actually destroy the nitrate. With oxygen in the water, though, that reaction doesn't happen. And those bacteria don't work when there's too much oxygen there. So that's one reason why nitrate tends to stick around. What about the Kaskaskia? That's where we get out of it. The Kaskaskia River? I don't know. It's, um, it's obviously draining a lot of agricultural land, so I guess there's some nitrate in it. Uh, the levels, but I, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. Bacteria destroy nitrate. Well, they're called denitrifying the bacteria. Okay, there's there's a, a series of them that, that can do the job. Okay, um, but it's, a, it's an energetic, energetically, energetically favorable reaction. They can actually get energy from converting the nitrogen, the nitrate to nitrogen gas. Okay, so they it's actually a fairly common reaction in the subsurface. Okay, so they small yeah, arrow. Right, so right. The that's the I ultimate put right. in my pond to kill the, the bacteria. Or to kill the algae. Mm. That's like copper sulfate. No, 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 no. Like, it's bacteria. Oh, oh it, bacteria. Kills, it, it kills the, the algae by just taking the nitrate away. Oh, okay, I'm not familiar with that. Mm. Works very well. Yeah. Yes, in Europe, uh, years ago, they had uh, drinking problems with their water which was contaminated, and they moved beer. How did the beer brewing process remove any contaminants at all? Well, it's alcohol, right? It was. It's, it's alcohol. So in the fermentation process, you kill, uh, you kill a lot of pathogenic bacteria. That's exactly right. That's why. That's why you should drink alcohol when you go abroad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's why I was in the Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
your body's not used to the microflora in the, in the water. So the back, the, yeah, in the fermentation process, these bacteria are killed. Now there's other bacteria that are in there, but they're not bad for you. That was the only uh, thing they took out of the water was the bacteria? Uh, they probably filtered it, I would guess. Um, but the filtering that's done doesn't remove bacteria. It's just not fine enough. To, 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 they're probably removing all the, the gunk and logs and things that are in the water. So the cooking process destroy most of the bacteria? Well, yeah, well, that would also, if they're boiling, if, anytime they're boiling, if they're boiling long enough, they should kill any sort of E. coli, for example. Right. Yeah, I mean, public waterways are full of bad bacteria. You don't want to. You don't want to drink straight out of a stream, right? You know, I always laugh when I see these uh, Jack Daniels ads. You know, they talk about their pure limestone spring water. I'm going, I know what that pure spring water is. I know what's up there. No. But, but yeah, when they distill it, you know, or they boil it, you know, they get rid of all that bacteria. So. Okay, um, just a few more slides on, on, on kind of nitrate. Um, this is just to show you that land use really is important. So what we do at the surface really affects the water quality. So this is a study Sam and I did uh, oh, about 10 years ago now. And um, this is all from wells. This, this is nitrate data from wells. Um, and we divided the land use based on, on four criteria. So we have agricultural, basically row crop land. Then we have land, farmland that had livestock on them. We had wooded land, and then we had urban land. And you can see I don't know how many of you are familiar with box and whisker now. You know, it's just a kind of a fancy way to show statistical data. The, the line in the middle of the box represents the median value for a bunch of data. And then the, uh, the, the size of the box represents kind of how, how much variability is in the data. So the, the, the bigger the box, the more variability. The smaller the box, the more tightly uh, are. And this is also a log scale. So we're going from really low to really high nitrate concentration. Well, I think you can see that in row crop and livestock land use areas, we get a lot more nitrate than we do in urban and wooded areas. Okay, and, uh, and also in livestock, if the situation is bad, you can get really, really high concentrations of nitrate. Okay, so we have um, we we measured several wells where some of them over 50 milligrams per liter. The highest was 80. Okay, and that's obviously really polluted water. Okay, and there, the, the animal manure is, is getting basically sucked right down into the system and they're pumping it right now. So land use obviously is important, especially in a, in a karst area. Um, I don't want to really get into, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but this is kind of some of the, one of the tools that we use. We're always looking for kind of a silver bullet to, to indicate where the actual contamination is coming from. We've never found one that works yet, so we have to use a bunch of different uh, tools and things like that to try to figure out where the contamination is coming from. And one of the things we do is plot up a lot of data. We make graphs like this, and this is just to show that um, when we plot up nitrate and chloride data, we can actually sort of group data into where we think the source of the contamination is coming from. For example, if you have a lot of chloride in your water with very little nitrate, well, the contamination is probably from road salt, okay, or possibly water softeners. Uh, but if you had like a lot of nitrate in your water but very little chloride, then it would be maybe just fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer that's present. Okay, well what we found in this area, and this is kind of, uh, this, this is data from our most recent studies, but this is what we've found pretty much all along in this area is that they're mixed sources. Okay, we can't identify from this data where the nitrate and the chloride are coming from. They're coming from a combination of sources. Okay, so septic manure, but also probably some fertilizer as well. Um, and, and if you think about it, a spring is basically uh, an area that's collecting water from a large, we call it spring shed. It's like a watershed. So all the water that falls into that particular spring shed is discharging at the bottom of that, where that spring comes out. So you can have a whole bunch of different land uses in your watershed. Okay, you can have wooded land, you can have agricultural land, you can have septic systems. So, you can, so we're, we often see these kind of mixed source kind of results for springs. Because springs are just, they're just collecting water from too large an area to really make a, a definitive determination of where the contamination might actually be coming from. We actually do a better job with wells because they're a much smaller point of influence. Uh, we can tell better from wells that the contamination is coming from. Yeah. Okay, earlier 
Fountain Creek was mentioned, and it's just a small example of what's going on. But um, I'm just curious whether anything statewide, if there's any effort statewide to control some of this, because just taking Fountain Creek, you've got all kinds of runoff from farm fields. You've got people with their cattle uh, down at the creek, walking around in the creek, pooping in the creek, run off from the field where the cattle are going into the creek. So you've got all these contaminants going into the creek, and of course then into the Mississippi, uh, contributing to the dead zone at the end of the river. And I'm just using that as one small example, because it's happening statewide. Is there any effort being made to try to control some of this? Well, there are. I mean, um, so a couple of things that, that I can mention, for example, anytime you discharge to a river from like a, a wastewater treatment plant, you have certain standards you have to be, there's a, you have to get permit to do that. Um, in the agricultural community, they, there are programs to kind of set aside um, vulnerable land, you know, like next to stream beds and things like that. The problem though is with cars is there's so many other issues that, that a statewide kind of program doesn't seem to cover too well. I don't know. Yeah. Sam or you know, Steve, do you have any comments on that? Uh, um, it's it's uh, extremely difficult. I yeah, but Sam was involved in a case up in Joe Davis County mm -hmm. where they were trying to put a, a, a livestock facility dairy in the karst area. And there were no regulations really to prevent that from yeah. that happening. Um, except common sense, which there wasn't a lot of it. Yeah. Well, the, the dairy was, it was a confined animal feeding operation. They had two facilities side by side that had, they were going to have like 10,000 uh, dairy cows. And uh, then they were going to shred, they had, had containment facilities, and then they were going to spread the manure uh, locally around, around those facilities. Uh, on uh, agricultural land. And, um, you know, people have been doing that for years, but when you do it in that volume and that, that massive amount of manure on a small area, uh, the groundwater becomes contaminated very quickly. And Walt and I were up in uh, Wisconsin, <coughs> and where there did a lot of confined animal feeding operations, and um, these the manure is applied all year long, so when we were up there, they had applied the manure to the, to the frozen ground, so the fields were brown. And then there was a thaw event, and this brown, foamy water was, was flowing. Oh, boy. Yeah, over the you know, the So we sampled one well that, uh, you know, that came out brown and foamy. It smelled like manure. And um, you know, we've already drank some, but it's just fine. It was the carp. They were sitting there waiting for the pee. Yeah, yeah. What did it taste like? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you probably gathered there's kind of a scale effect. There's no real agency that's kind of covering all this. There's different agencies covering different parts of it. IEPA covers uh, like public water supplies, so they make sure that public water supply wells are protected, things like that. But like you said, I mean, you know, there's no nothing really preventing, as far as I know, nothing preventing the farmer from allowing his livestock to. And there's also there's like you're supposed to inspect your septic tank if you live out in the country and have a septic tank, but really, who wants to do that? And if things get old, they fail, and then with any any around here in these drainage basins of these sinkholes, there's, you know, if there's 50 or 70 landowners in there and different land practices, it's kind of politically difficult to tell everyone to stop doing whatever they do. So we're going to just keep feeding the dead zone at the end of the river, basically. Yeah. Well, sir, I mean, we have signed on to a program, the state has signed on to this program that's supposed to be cutting back on it, but I don't know how it goes. It's getting a lot of different interest groups to work together, which, as you know, is not an easy thing to do. Well, compared to, um, 
compares to what things were like, what the Illinois River well, that's 100 years ago. Yeah. If you think about 100 years ago, we're doing better. How's that? <laughs> really? Right. I don't know if that helps you. Yeah, really. it's not saying. <laughs> All right, so here's a little figure that we made just to kind of show you what's happening in our <coughs> system. So if you think about a stream or a spring, and, and, uh, and here's your level of nitrate that's in the water, and then you have a rain event. Okay, so what happens when you have a rain event? You get a lot of nice, clean, clean water that gets into the system. So if you have uncontaminated groundwater, <coughs> we're saying that this is just naturally occurring nitrate. It drops, and then as the, as the water is moved off the system, then the, the concentration will go back up. Okay, but if you have sources of contamination in the system, uh, manure or fertilizer that's, that's kind of in the soil, you know, and it's kind of waiting there for the rain to what will happen is you get spikes sometimes in concentrations of nitrates and flushing out uh, the system. Of course, this depends on kind of the, the, you know, the weather conditions. So oftentimes, um, after a long dry period, you get a big rain, rain event, then you get a big flush material, you get a lot of nitrate from that. If it's been raining for, you know, last month, then you won't really see this, this spike. But the, the soil and the unsaturated zone can store a lot of material. <laughs> this is what this is just showing. Can I butt in on that one? Yes, please. Do. Um, one thing I've thought is interesting lately is that actually maybe it's that it's the second rain event after a dry period. The first one kind of saturates the soil. It's like the soil is dried out. It's a big sponge, and it rains, and it gets that sponge kind of wet. And then it rains again, and then all that stuff pushes through. So that the soil in the top part above the, the uh, water table, that, that stores water, but throughout the year it dries out. And you can think of even when you get down into the rock where all those cracks are, it's like a big bucket with a bunch of holes in it, and it's dripping. And if you go into the cave, sure enough, it's dripping from the ceiling. But in the dry season, it drips less. You don't notice that unless you really actually count drops like I do. <laughs> but uh, it's a bucket. Some holes are big and some are small. So uh, the storage in that water changes in its chemistry during that day. <coughs> the chemistry of the water dripping out of there. And it's different from what's in the cave stream. So it's a, it's a complicated system with lots of things going on at once. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, focal pole clay. I'll just show some of the results we've gotten from here. Uh, Steve, you want to explain this? So, the cave stream, this is the cave stream, and it's just like a um, surface stream. It's got branching tributaries. This is 15 miles long of humanly interval passage. It's the longest cave in Illinois, and I think it's around number 50 in the United States in length. So you can see the direction of water flow. The humanly interval passage stops where the water enters the ceiling of this tube. So you're walking through a tube, not unlike a, a storm drain in a city, and the water is transported rapidly through there as are nutrients. So if you're sampling at a spring, you would rather go to a sand and gravel aquifer where the water gently percolates through and the bacteria have time to eat up all the contaminants you get, pristine water. In a car system, down go the contaminants straight to the spring in like, I don't know, thousands of feet per day, the water can move quickly, and there it is, contaminated right at the spring. Click one more time. So it also has sub-basins, and we've named them based on features in the cave here. And what we've done, we, if you remember his graph of the nitrates and um, chloride earlier with the red dots, we sampled three spots in Fogelpole Cave. And um, those are three little tiny symbols there in the middle capturing those numbered drainage basins one, two, and three. Number three is the one that had the best water quality. Well, it's only measuring this little tiny stream that is capturing a small area, but it's capturing basically a pristine basin. The other two are averaging contamination. So although the contaminant levels in those was moderate, it was also averaging for some areas where, where clean water diluting the contamination. In other areas, it's collecting up water were more contaminated than what our data shows. So if you were trying to track down a problem and had lots and lots of money, you could work your way upstream, sampling side streams at, at at those junction points to try to identify the source of the problem. And you said, what's, what's up above those? Um, the yeah. ground is above the area. Uh, sinkholes, just like on this last one. Oh, yeah, mixed cultural. rural, residential, soybean fields, corn fields, a few cattle. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Back up, uh, question. Uh, yeah. Steve or uh, um, Dr. Kelly, um, the 
three main areas, Northwest, Lemonade, and Zebra. Why have you called that Lemonade and Zebra, those two um, areas there? So when the, the cavers are in the cave mapping it, which is a really slow process with they have a compass and a tape, and they have a sketchbook, and they're measuring distances, and they name passages. This is the Lemonade Passage. This is Northwest Passage. The zebra passage must have had some sort of stripy bedrock in it or something. I'm so it's sure. just whatever they encounter when yeah, they're it's studying. Just, it's like a place name. Okay. Let's go to local celebrity here. Uh, Bob Weck, the classic sample. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I want to thank Bob. Bob was very helpful in the previous project. He did a lot of the sampling for us. So you can see him taking a collecting a water sample here. This this instrument right here, which I know this is not connected at the moment, but it's collecting, uh, when it is connected, it collects what we call field parameters. Yeah, it's logging. It's logging. There you go. Uh, temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, conductance. So it's measuring things in the field that we need to know and that would change if we took it back to the lab and made a measurement there. So. I one, one other thing, and then in the background, there's the two guys on the right, or actually the the guy in the yellow hat, helmet and the girl sitting down are um, graduate students and the guy in the background with gray sweatshirts and undergraduates are also <laughs> trying to start the next generation of people, train them on how to do this sort of stuff. This is site number two, right? Yes. And here's uh, Steve. Actually, site number one is actually you have to go through water to get there. And Steve loved the kayak down there and <laughs> likes to paddle on his own. It's, it's the water is over eight feet deep, and because we're hitting a bunch of sites, you could wear a wetsuit and swim across it, but it's just faster to have a little boat and zip over to the <coughs> Plus, we're cool for your pretty cold water. Um, it's actually, once you get down into a cave, and wherever you are, it's the average yearly temperature for that place. So in an ideal setting here, it would be 56 degrees or so Fahrenheit in the caves. Although this, in the summer, you may have um, tributaries that run on the surface for a while and go in, and so it's warmer, and in the winter it can be colder. I've seen ice chunks floating in there in the winter. <laughs> so the water is the same it, it, it would be 56 in an yeah. ideal setting, but it fluctuates some with this. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Even 56, though. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's quite pleasant to walk through. Swimming through might not be so. <laughs> So uh, just, uh, just to show some of the data we've been collecting, we've been collecting a lot of different things. There's temperature, pH, I've already showed you the nitrate and chloride data. There's uh, fecal coliform, okay, so that's E. coli, I've all heard of that one. Components of fecal coliform. So you can see that the cave uh, is contaminated with that. And even site three, that, that nice little um, small, fairly pristine area had a couple of hits of uh, fecal coliform. So where that's coming from, we're not sure. You did not test the zebra area? We did not. Not in the study. We just didn't have funding to, to do that. To do that. So, yeah, this, these things cost money. So. Um, not real. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a study that, that Steve was part of. This is just to show these are uh, caves and springs in Illinois that, that he sampled over like, 15 years ago, I guess. Just to show that um, most Caves and streams, cave streams and springs are contaminated with, with fecal bacteria. And if you see that little blue area, that's that's kind of Monroe County sinkhole plain. That's one of the worst. Okay, and that's just because of the geology mainly. It's such a you know the conduits are so large, water moves so rapidly in this area. Um, so that's that's life in the karst area. <laughs> Um, we've, uh, in one of our studies, we've identified different uh, species of bacteria. These are all fecal bacteria. You've heard, of course, uh, E. coli, I'm sure. There's also some staph and strep and things like that. So um, you can see that almost all the springs are contaminated. Wells are much better off than springs, okay, because they're deeper. They're, they're sampling a smaller area. Um, but uh, it's interesting, the, the springs and the septic systems are pretty similar, okay. The amount of, the amount of fecal bacteria we we, we identified the springs <coughs> and septic systems are similar. What do you call a septic, septic tank, or what are you talking well, about? Well, um, this particular study, I think, was just a discharge from the right back Yeah, yeah. For, for this study, we used uh, aeration systems, exclusively. And um, uh, the reason we did them was because they're accessible. <laughs> and, um, the leach fields, you know, we'd have had them dig or put them in the well 
lines and to intercept that material, but but the aeration systems had a discharge point, and they were well, a lot of the ones we sampled were in uh, subdivisions where they where they had people professional people coming out and servicing these things on a regular basis. So they were working as well as they possibly could, and still um, <coughs> over two-thirds of them were, were putting out uh, fecal coliforms in excess of what uh, the regulatory levels were. So, so and then some of them just absolutely didn't work at all, and they were just horrible. It's still being like you call it fresh as spring water. I'm sorry, what? You could call the septic output yes, the spring water. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, that's right. So good. They didn't know something about it. So I mentioned we were always looking for, for silver balls to, to help us out. And one of them that we thought was going to help, which, anyway, we, we work with a professor in civil engineering at the University of Illinois who has a, a method for it. So there's, you know, there's all these new DNA and RNA techniques that have been coming out to try to identify different sources of contamination and, and this was part of the study we did, I guess this was just this past year, um, where they, they have a, a, a way of actually comparing what's in the sample with, with where, what kind of animal it must have come from, whether it was a human, a cow, or a horse, a pig, you know, they could actually identify, so they said. Okay. Um, so the results were a little mixed though, and, but again, this is the problem with sampling springs. Is that you've got a mix of things, and we found that um, you don't want to look too closely at this, but just to, just to show that most of the springs and caves had human and animal contamination. The animals were both pigs and cows. Mm -hmm. Even if we couldn't identify pigs in the watershed, we somehow ended up with what they said were pig bacteria. So that kind of surprised us. We weren't quite sure why we were doing that. So I don't know if it was a false negative or what. So and also, also these. These bacteria are supposed to be specific to those right. host animals, and we didn't have one for horses, for example, which are actually fairly common in Monroe County. We didn't have a marker for that. Apparently, you didn't look for things like deer and possum and coon. Yeah, that's another thing. That's you know, right. having, having fecal coliform at some level is natural. Right. You do, yeah, I mean, right. going in the caves is really common to see raccoon latrines. Which, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. another way to think about that is if you're getting a karst spring, then you know a raccoon is somewhere upstream using it as a bathroom, mm -hmm. so it don't use it as drinking water. Right. Uh, we've, we've done a little bit of pesticide sampling. This is from uh, some data from uh, the sample I worked on back in the late 90s. Um, this is atrazine, which is one of the major uh, herbicides. It's been used less and less in the last five or so years. Uh, but what we found was this was. Um, Collier and Indian Hole Springs. Indian Hole is the uh, discharge point for Coldwell Cave. That's mm -hmm. where it comes out. And then we were sampling down a bridge that was further downstream from that. But just to show that we did detect atrazine coming through the, um, the springs and the, and the river, but it was in the summertime, which is kind of when you'd expect it when it was being applied. So it's you know, it moving through fairly rapidly, and in the winter, Late fall, winter, we didn't see it come through. Uh, those brackets indicate the range. Of the exactly. Day. That's right. Yeah. So that was like the median value. <laughs> so, so. And this is micrograms per liter, which is parts per billion. So again, not very high concentrations, but those are levels that can be that can affect some aquatic species. Uh, we did a little more pesticide sampling in this, this previous study. Um, and we looked for 41 pesticides and pesticide degradation products and pesticides do decay uh, when they're in the environment. Uh, we found two compounds detected in all our samples, DDT once and 2,4-D twice. Um, and they were only found in, in, I think, in the May sample, so it was the time of year we expect to find them. So we didn't find most of it. Most of them we can't collect in the winter time, so we wouldn't expect it to, to find them anyway. So this wasn't really a very this, this study wasn't designed really to look at pesticides; it just kind of something uh, we threw in there. Um, and then for the last few minutes, I want to talk about what we're doing now, and, and uh, we're doing some more sampling. We're, we just completed our third round of sampling this past week. Um, and one of the things we're looking at is what's called pharmaceuticals and personal care products, or PPCPs. And hormones. So some of you may be familiar with, with uh, what's going on with this is considered emerging contaminants. Um, these are basically um, 
well, you know, pharmaceuticals are personal care products or things like uh, fragrances and cosmetics. So um, these are of interest that have become a big interest in the last 10 years or so. Now, these are things that are only we're finding at very low levels in the environment. And the reason we're, we're finding is our technology has gotten so good that we can find like molecules in swimming pool sized water samples, you know. Uh, so these things probably existed all our history that we've had these kind of compounds, but we're only been able in the last 10 or 20 years to actually detect these things, the concentrations they are in the environment. And um, the question is, are these bad for the environment? And the, question, the answer is maybe. We don't really know yet. Um, hormones seem to be probably worse from, from studies that have been published so far. Um, we, we, there have been studies that have indicated that there's been changes in fish sex, so feminization of male to female fish because of estrogen, estrogenic compounds in the water. So, and again, we're talking about really, really low levels, like super quadrillion levels. Okay, these are extremely low levels, but they, they're, they're high enough, apparently, if you live in the water, they can affect you. Okay, there have been studies showing fish and frogs. Uh, they've been affected. Whether these are affecting humans, if we drink this water, nobody knows. Okay. And the pro part of the problem is there's so many of these compounds, and they're in such diverse mixtures. You know, maybe the mixture is bad, but the, this, the individual compound would be bad. I mean, a lot of these compounds are stuff that we take every day. Some of us, you know, caffeine obviously we take every day. Uh, the proxen, ibuprofen, Advil, and Advil. You know, so these are these are the things that we look for in this paper study. These are all fairly common uh, drugs or products that are used. Uh, a few of them are less common, uh, but we looked for them because previous studies have indicated that they have been found. Okay, so there was like uh, one of these is. Uh, is I can't find it. Uh, there's one that's like a, a drug for epilepsy, um, an anti-convulsive drug. And it's, it's, I don't think it's prescribed that often, but it's very uh, persistent in the environment, so we go to that particular one. Oh yeah, carbamazepine. Right. All right, and these are the hormones that we look. And these are natural for the most part, but there are some um, artificial ones that are used in like birth control <coughs> medication. So don't worry about the names. Uh, but we've, we've sampled three times. We've only got results for two of them so far. You can see some of the compounds we are detecting them. Okay. Uh, Trichocarbon, we found quite a bit of that. Uh, interesting, we didn't find caffeine in the first round of sampling, but we found it a lot in the second round of sampling. So this is very preliminary work. Um, we're just, at this point, just trying to find out what's there. And then hopefully we'll, we'll get some funding, more funding to do a more detailed study down the road. Um, here's the uh, hormones we haven't detected so much. We found a couple of hits in our June sampling. Uh, we we're, were wondering about this last sample we took this past month. There were, there's one idea was like, well, people take more drugs in the wintertime. So maybe we'll see more from this last sample than we did in the previous sample. Well, the only way they could get there is from like. Stuff exists exactly. in the sewage. Right? Exactly. It's just passing right through us. Okay. The drug doesn't isn't completely used in our body. It passes through our waste and goes throughout the receptive system to our system. Right? Yeah. Well, some people do throw them. Some people do throw them away. And, and as, you, as you know, as you probably know, you are not supposed to dump things on the toilet anymore. I hope everyone's learned that one, right? There are supposed to be programs, the health department usually runs them. Sometimes uh, pharmacies, sometimes police stations to take unused drugs. Please use those, okay, so they can be actually instead of destroyed instead of. Well, they are. So we used to be doing what they told us to do in the past, right? Don't just dump it down your toilet. Well, don't do that. I, actually, I think the people in this room probably know that very well, but yeah. so it's up to us to probably get the word out because I think a lot of people don't know. I'm always offering to people if you have, you know, to go through their, especially with children, you always have these medicines and they have to grow them so quick and yeah. go bad. Or something. <laughs> Check your medicines that if you have expired, you're going to need another Good. Good. Are you doing any testing in your densely populated areas? We personally uh, have not. Have we? We're sampling up. Uh, well, we are. We have started a project. That's mainly with the viruses. Chicago region. So uh, there has been some work up in the Chicago area, but we haven't really done part of it. I would think it was around higher in Yes. 
Yes, because all that sewage is going out into those canals. Exactly. A perfectly functioning septic or aeration system wouldn't prevent pharmacological products. That's anyway, correct. Right? That's right. That's right. I mean, you, these things pass through some of the most sophisticated wastewater treatment plants in the world, and they come out un unchanged because they're not designed to remove them. Last time, I, or not last time, last year, one time when I was in Bogopol, I found an intact prescription pill bottle. So, and what that means is. Um, people have traditionally seen sinkholes as a place to dump their trash. You put your trash in there, your old prescription, then you may not have to have anything left in the septic tank. A half full pill bottle is in just the right place. It's going to crack open and suddenly all this stuff come out. That also helps explain. I don't know if you noticed he mentioned DDT earlier, which, as you know, is, is no longer used. but. Um, people do throw out old cans of pesticides when they finally get around to cleaning out that old barn and if they're throwing them in a sinkhole, it could take years for that thing to get jams, it gets in the soil, then remember his <coughs> so finally the soil thing collapses down, comes this rusty old can and cracks open and suddenly there's a bolt of DDT going through the cave, you know, 50 years later, so um, okay. that's how that We're about out of time, but uh, I didn't... Real quickly, for those of you who are well owners, these last two slides are for you. Okay? The water Survey has a public service laboratory, and we provide a water analysis to citizens of the United States, uh, Illinois, who own private wells. It used to be free, I'm sorry, it's no longer free. Um, it's $35, which you will never find a price that cheap for uh, a well water analysis. And I encourage you. Uh, if you haven't done it before, please contact our labs and they'll send you the bottles and instructions and you'll learn something about your well water. They can also, if you have a treatment system, they can also, for an additional $15, they'll also analyze the treated water. But we, we do it because we want the raw water sample because that's a really good use to us. Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, one of our guys in our, in our section has developed a private well online class and has gotten really good reviews from the people who have taken it. Uh, so it's designed to educate homeowners about their private wells and how to take care of them, how to understand them. It's a self-paced thing. I think it's a 10, maybe 10 lessons or something like that. You get them in the email. You can do them at, at your leisure. Okay, it's, it's kind of meant to be done over a 10-week period, but you don't have to do it at that point. Um, here's the, here's the uh, URL. You can also get to it through the water survey web page. I have some cards up here. Cool. If you want to take those, you can contact me and I can also send this to you. Yeah. How often should you have your well checked? Well, you know, we, we um, it really depends on where your well is, how deep it is, what kind of aquifer it's in. Um, I would say down in this area, you might want to Check it every couple of years. I don't know. I, it kind of depends on if there's if there's activity going on around your property. It might be good. And you know, we always tell people if, if something is is going to happen near their property in the future, like some kind of construction or something going on that they're worried about, a landfill going in, get your water sample tested right away so that you have that background sample so that you know later if you have a problem, if you have contamination, you'll know what to compare it to. You can say, well, here's what my water quality was on this date. After you put this thing in, now my water quality is like this. So. But you also need to consider the time of the year you're doing it. Exactly. So that's, that's why I was kind of... Here it's, it's different. Yeah. July. It's... Um, I would guess you might want to think about doing it in the late spring, early summer. Probably. Yeah. 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 Right, I mean, well, that's well, that's well, that's true. So I would say it's the, it's the bacteria is the biggest problem well, if you have that problem. Down. So if you're um, if you're near a, a livestock facility, you know that might be an issue for you. So that's from a health perspective, I would say the bacteria is the most important to worry about. You know, like you, you you may have nitrate contamination, but it may be a level that it's not really a health. What's the effect of nitrate contamination on people? 
Well, that's a good question. It's, it's a little bit controversial. So there, there have been studies in the past that suggest that it's problems for, for bottle-fed infants, mm -hmm. that they cannot process section of the nitrate, that they can't process in their body, and it affects the oxygen, I think, right? Um, yeah. And they actually turn blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, the nitrate <coughs> attaches to the hemoglobin instead of the oxygen, so it displaces the oxygen. So they, they're they oxygen-deprived, and they, they turn blue. And, uh, it could happen to adults too with enough nitrogen. That'd be really high. What level of nitrogen? Infants don't have about. the ability to, to deal with it. So, but it's not like they're bottle fed. You know, for breastfed, it's not a problem. So. But like I said, there, there are also some studies that suggest there may be some, some links to cancer, but yeah. the studies are, are really, uh, they're not definitive really yet. Yeah, good question. Me? Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be local, though. But... A year, year and a half ago, the Maystown, village of Maystown, central well system, 1,200 foot deep well was affected by nitrate and the state had to bring in bottled water for all children for a year or two. And the village had to get massive grant bailout in excess of a million dollars to re-drill their well. And that was just a year and a half ago. That's yeah. a if it goes above the level. And it's happening in Evansville and Randolph right now. They get their water from Cass Cass. We live near a lake and the owners of the lake are concerned. We have an, uh, what do you call an aeration system that I'd like to have tested. And our, our water from the Cascascia is not tasting good. I'd like to help you know where I as a homeowner can pay to go have that, all those three things tested. Um, you should contact our lab. They may have some ideas about Is that the third thing? Yeah, but actually, I'll give you my card. Just contact me. If if you're actually getting your drinking water from the river, they would they would do an analysis of that for you. Our lab. Oh, yeah. So it's I'm mainly it's I'm mainly for that's what we wells. Yeah, we're not getting them from wells. Yeah, but if you're getting if you're actually getting a drink water straight from the river, yeah, you know, they would do an analysis. We do, we, are. we don't know because when you ask our township, they say, well, it comes from here, it comes from there. Comes oh, now is that going into public water supply? Oh, well, see, they they should provide you with a report every year about the water quality. Well, there's always a report in there every year that we're about to get the water Oh, yeah, so now I yeah, is in charge of uh, water quality and water 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 water
but not necessarily. A large part of the property that we, or a large part of the overall system, yeah. underlays uh, the farm property that Clifftop was able to purchase uh, last year. Not all of it, um, but with our purchase, we acquired between 11 and 12 percent of the total recharge area, which I know doesn't necessarily sound like a lot, but when you think about it, we're able on that patch of land to have control, if you will, mm -hmm. over almost 12 percent of a total ecosystem, and that's kind of a cool fact. Yeah. And actually, I'm thank you very much for asking that question because before um, we let Steve and Walt and Sam and Bob Black leave today, I would ask everyone here to give them a very hearty thank you. They were our chief advisors, especially Steve, and put us on a learning curve shaped like a hockey stick as we worked through grant proposals to get this project done. And quite frankly, it would not have happened without them and their able, willing, and friendly assistance. So thank you. Thank you and good day. <laughs> <laughs>